Good morning, everybody. Good to be together. I love, 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 love when Hope City Kids gets up here. There's just nothing cuter. I don't think there's anything funnier. And I'm just, I'm, I'm cheering for the kid that's going to just not do what everybody else is doing because that kid was probably me as a child. <laughs> and so, man, I'm just, man, I love that kid. So anyway, hey, listen, uh, today is Palm Sunday, the Sunday before Easter when Christians all around the world will celebrate uh, Jesus' triumphant entry into Jerusalem. And uh, that we celebrate that. We call it Easter Celebration Sunday, and we try and make it as big a deal as possible. But my name is Peter. If we haven't met yet, I would love the opportunity to meet you after service out in the lobby. Today is Cold Brew Sunday. I don't know if you are aware of that. Like, we're bringing cold brew back for this Sunday only, so it's special. Go out in the lobby and grab some of that. Um, But I also want to welcome some of those friends that are not in the room. If you're tuning in online, we're so glad that you're here. But there are some days you just got to be here. And this was one one of those, to experience what's going on in Hope City Kids and Hope City Youth. But everybody else in the room, would you help me welcome our friends that are tuning in in the podcast and online and YouTube. We're glad that you're here, glad that you're a part of our church. And hey, Easter is right around the corner. Like it is going to be here before you know it. And and I'm so excited about it because this week I was handing out some of my invite cards and I'm praying for some of my friends that I've invited to join us at, at Hope City Church for Easter. And so I'm inviting you to invite somebody to church. Like, you don't got to invite everybody, but you got to invite somebody. Somebody you know needs to be here with you next weekend. So there's cards in the seat backs in front of you and also on the way out. But man, I told you that this is a spring and summer not to miss at Hope City. And here's one of the reasons why. Because the Sunday after Easter, so Easter's a big deal. Love it. It's going to be awesome. The Sunday after Easter, you've got to be here. We're starting a new series called Attacking Anxiety. And what we're going to be doing is if we believe that we have no greater hope than the hope in Jesus, and we've got no greater king and no greater victory, then we know that God can do some incredible things inside of our hearts and our minds, especially when it comes to attacking anxiety. And on week one, we have the privilege and the honor of hosting my pastor, Pastor Derek Fry. Um, He pastors me all the way up from Bruins territory in Boston, but I'm not going to hold it against him. Like, we don't need to worry about that. Uh, We just know that Tampa Bay is better. But uh, I'm excited for him to to be here with us. And because you haven't had a chance to meet him yet, I wanted to give you a flavor of what that Sunday is going to be like. So check out the screen. Hey, welcome to Connect Church. My name is Pastor Derek. Everybody calls me PD. Say, what's up, PD? It's just kind of an affectionate conglomeration, you know, of Pastor and Derek and Disaster and Destroyer and all that. Just kind of put it into one and just call me PD. If you come to this service, you're going to get all of it. You're going to get the rotisserie chicken version of the whole message. I'm not going to leave anything out. All the bones, everything, okay? How do you get the power of God in your life, Pastor Derek? I'm so glad you asked me. You get the water. The water is equivalent to, similar to, likened to worship. It's my worship. That's the water. I'm coming for you. My son used to always say this. I'm coming for bodies. If you've been watering the seed, if you've been worshiping God, when the enemy comes around, hey, hey, you can say, see you later. Walk on by. Not going to happen here today. But some of us are just kind of like, we're too, we're too, too cozy with God. We're too cute with God. We're too prideful and arrogant with God. And we're not willing sometimes to get a little undignified and rip our jacket off and raise our hands and open up our mouths because I don't do that. But God got on the cross for you and openly before all gave himself for the, for the joy that was before him. He endured the cross for you. It's been so good to you. And you can't get up and worship him and say how grateful you are for him and thank God for 20 minutes a week on a Sunday morning. Can I have a better amen? I'm feeling convicted. I don't know about you, but that's, there's some powerful juice, like some stuff there. Let's, let's go. Uh, but I'm telling you, you don't want to miss it. It's going to be a phenomenal Sunday to hear from Pastor Derek Fry. So bring somebody with you to, to for that series and that, and certainly to that Sunday. Now, how many of you went home last week and you were like a little hungry, right? Like you left service and you're like, let's get some tortilla chips and some salsa. You stopped at at Publix on the way home and you picked some. Anybody? Anybody? Let's be honest. A few of you. Okay. Some of you did. Thank you. That's awesome. Um, How many of you went home and signed up for Dollar Shave Club? Anybody? 
If not, I should send you a referral code because I could get some free stuff, right? Or uh, how many of you went home and you uh, became season ticket holders of the Bolt? Anybody? Because we're about to be best friends. Uh, <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. And if you're here and you're like, what is he talking about? Uh, you need to go back and listen to week one. Because in week one, we talked about the fact that the, the things we talk about uh, are the things we love. Or we talk about what we love. It's just a part of what we do. Let me tell you what my kids have done. Let me tell you what's going on in my life. Let me tell you blah, 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 blah. And you talk about the things that you love. You do it. I do it. Your kids do it. Uh, but here's the funny thing, though, is when you listen to people talk about what they love, your mind instantly starts going to the things that you have previously experienced in that realm. So let me talk about it. Like, so for tortilla chips, I talked about, you know, the two and a half pound bag that you get from, <laughs> from Costco. Ridiculous, right? Like, it is, it's a huge bag of chips. But you might be going back to the last time that you had tortilla chips. You might have had, like, um, tortilla chips with no salt on it, right? The Bible calls that sin, by the way. That's, that's defined as sin. That is not allowed. Or maybe you had them with a hint of lime. That's a gray area in Scripture. We're really not sure about that. Um, or maybe you had, like, scoops, and, and that's like, you know, that little guacamole shovel that, that <laughs> they make that for you. It comes in a bag. And, and so you're thinking, well, what's up with these? Like, your expectations were somewhere in that strata, and you're surprised by what actually happens sometimes, Right? That's not what I expected, or that tastes differently, and that doesn't do what, I th what it said it would do. Have you ever experienced something that, you know, it was advertised one way, but experienced in another? And it can cause you to ask this question. Am I missing something? I must be missing something, right? Like, any of you paid attention to the Oscars, the Academy Awards? Like, they, they pick out really good movies, theoretically. So Tiffany was like, hey, we should watch this movie. I heard that it was nominated for an Academy Award. And so we started watching it, and very quickly I was like, well, I see why it didn't win, right? Like, this is awful. Like, this is, this is terrible. Shut this off. Like, I'd rather watch Bluey or something. Like, this is just, I don't, this is, I don't want to do it. Am I missing something, right? Or maybe you've been working out and eating healthy, or you're doing, like, that intermittent fasting, and you're like, man, when's that glow that everybody's talking about going to finally hit? Like, or when am I going to experience deeper sleep and more fulfilled life? And you're just sore and hungry all the time, right? Like, am I missing something? Or how about this? Maybe you feel distant from God, and you wonder why things don't feel the way that they used to feel. Am I missing something, right? Like, you can ask these questions. We can all find ourselves in situations where we would say, I feel like I'm missing something. Have you ever been to a Palm Sunday and thought, you know what? I, I feel like I might be missing something. And Palm Sunday actually may be a day that is best categorized by that question, am I missing something? See, I want to I unpack that for you today. And in fact, that's exactly the way that the disciples must have been feeling. They've been spending time with Jesus for three years, right? Think about everything that they've done. They have spent time with Jesus. They have watched him uh, turn water into wine. They have seen him walk on water. They have seen him restore blind people's sight. They have seen him heal people that cannot walk. They have seen him say, in Jesus' name, you are forgiven. They have seen him cast out demons. We've talked about some of these things. And yet, in this part of Scripture, Jesus says some things that leave them going, wait a second, am I missing something? Here's what I want you to do. I want you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 10. We're going to be in Mark chapter 10, verse 32. But I also want to invite you to take your phones out and tap that circle right in front of you. That is the fastest way to engage with Hope City. You can find uh, message notes there. You can find everything that you need. The, the weekly update uh, from Hope City is there, everything that's going on in your church. So go ahead and do that and follow along in message notes today. But in Mark chapter 10, starting in verse 32, it says, They were on their way up to Jerusalem, with Jesus leading the way. And the disciples were astonished, while those who followed were afraid. Again, he took the twelve aside, and he told them what was going to happen to him. See, Jesus knew exactly what was going to happen. Like, he knew... And he knew, and he knew. And in fact, three times he told his disciples. So it wasn't just like one time you know, where you say, like, maybe he had some bad guacamole. Like, I don't know. Like, maybe he's you know, not feeling too good today. No, he told them three times that he was going to go to Jerusalem to suffer and die. 
He was going to go up to Jerusalem and suffer and die. See, Jerusalem, Jeru, Salem, Salem is translated into peace, so the city of peace. But Jerusalem was anything and going to be anything but peaceful for Jesus. In fact, this is the third time that he says, this is not going to be very peaceful for me. In verse 33, we pick up, it says, we're going to Jerusalem, the city of peace, he said, and the son of man will be betrayed to the chief priests and teachers of the law. They will condemn him to death and will hand him over to the Gentiles who will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. And three days later, he will rise. Just, just picture this, right? Like this is what Jesus says to his disciples. And those guys are like, am I missing something? Did, did, did he say something that I missed out on? Like, is there something else happening? Like, this is what they're saying. In fact, they're saying, wait, 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 wait. I thought you were the promised Messiah. And they believed that. I thought that you were the promised king that Israel's been waiting for, right? So, yeah, let's go to Jerusalem, man. Let's go to Jerusalem because we're going to see a coronation, right? You're going to be crowned king, Jesus. We're going to go to the capital. We're going to take this thing over. The city of David, baby. Come on. Because Jesus is now going public. He's going public because he's got the people behind him, right? They're all excited. And the religious leaders are starting to be afraid, as they should be, because Jesus is growing in power and popularity. And Jesus is like, whoa, 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 whoa. Slow down, guys. Like, slow your roll, right? I'm going to Jerusalem to suffer and die. They're going to arrest me, condemn me, and torture me, and then murder me. But my peace I leave with you, right? Like three days later, I'm going to rise from the dead. Even though he predicted it three times, his disciples still don't get it. But this was a part of God's plan from the very beginning that he would send his son Jesus to heal a broken world. And not just heal the broken world, because that's when we can look at something so globally. And we can say, oh, yeah, yeah, I believe that God died for everybody. No, no, he died on the cross for you, for me. This is personal. Palm Sunday is personal. Now imagine this Sunday morning of, on Palm Sunday. It, it happens to be Passover Sunday. And Passover is about to start. It's a week-long religious festival for the Jewish people. So Passover was celebrating Israel's most important historic moment where God miraculously delivered the nation of Israel out of Egyptian slavery. And at Passover, Jews from all over the Roman world would pour into Jerusalem, the city of David, to celebrate their exodus from Egypt. You know, the Old Testament book of Exodus, that story. They're celebrating and remembering that. So Jerusalem was packed. They would say on average 200,000 people, pilgrims, would come into Jerusalem and find their way there. And Mark 11.1 1 says, as they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage and Bethany at the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two of his disciples, saying to them, Go into the village ahead of you. Just as you enter it, you're going to find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. This is important. This, this little nugget is very important. Now, I've stood on the Mount of Olives. I've stood in that place, and I've looked out over the city of Jerusalem. It's beautiful. Like, you get a panoramic view of the entire city of Jerusalem. And if you're there today on the Mount of Olives, you're looking out and you're seeing the gold dome, right, on the, on the dome of the rock. And, and that is a, a, a mosque that is on top of the holy, it's a holy site for both Muslims and Jews. The dome of the rock was the site of the Jewish temple. And the western wall of that temple is in the old city, and that's the place that we would call the Wailing Wall, or the place where Jews will come and they will pray every Sabbath. There, there are Jews there every single day. And Jesus says, bring me a donkey, a young donkey, so I can ride from here, the Mount of Olives, to there, Jerusalem. This is an odd request, because in all of Scripture, what has Jesus been doing? He's been walking everywhere, right? Like, he is walking from here to there. And now, all he's got left is like a half-mile little jaunt, and he says, go find me a donkey, right? It doesn't make any sense. Am I missing something? Like, what's going on? But Jesus is about to show them that he's the king of kings. See, 500 years before this moment, the prophet Zechariah, he prophesied, that, and he gave a promise to the Jews of the Old Testament he says this in Zechariah 9, verse 9, he predicted, Shout in triumph, O people of Jerusalem. Look, your king is coming to you. He's righteous and victorious, yet he's humble, riding on a donkey, riding on a donkey's colt. 
So everyone in Jerusalem would be looking for this. They would know about this. They would know that this prophecy, that the coming king would ride into Jerusalem on a donkey. And so Jesus is intentionally sending a signal, right? He's saying, I am the long-awaited king, right? Promised by the prophets. In other words, he is openly announcing that he's the Messiah. He's the Savior. And he's saying, Jesus is no ordinary king. And the kingdom that Jesus would establish is no ordinary kingdom either. We've seen kings come in our lifetime, right? We've seen queens rise to power. We have seen people, um, we've witnessed people. In fact, in, in recently we've, we've witnessed uh, King Charles and his coronation after the passing of Queen Elizabeth. Prince Charles was crowned king, and do you remember how he showed up to Buckingham Palace? Not on a donkey, right? <laughs> like, uh-uh. Like, he had hundreds, hundreds of royal guards that walked in front of him. He had this massive procession. And just because they do things, like, in, in pomp and circumstance, he was pulled in a gold coach. Like, look at that thing. And a gold coach. And, and he has eight uh, Windsor Greys, these horses, these magnificent white horses, pulling this. And catch this. This is the best. This is the best part of this whole story. King Charles, before he was coronated, he had instructions that said, listen, this is going to be the simplest, the least expensive coronation that we have ever experienced in the nation of, of England. And this is what you get, right? Like, <laughs> you're like, what? That's the simplest? Like, this is the dumbed down version of coronation? Like, I'd love to see what full tilt would have been, right? Jesus is like, mm, this is, I am no ordinary king. That is ordinary. What you just saw, that's ordinary. That's expected. But Jesus comes in and he announces his, his kingdom on the back of a donkey. Because he's saying, my kingdom is not about wealth and power and prestige. My kingdom is about humility, peace, and service. He's riding a donkey to show that the shepherd king is coming to serve his people. To serve you. Remember, this is personal. So what kind of king is this, right? What do we do with this? Am I missing something? What? But the story wasn't done. Because when they brought the cult uh, to Jesus, they threw cloaks over it. He sat on it. And many people spread their cloaks on the road, while others spread branches they had cut in the fields. See, this is why we spread palm branches, or why we wave palm branches on Palm Sunday, because the act of these people was they would go out, they would go into the fields, they'd cut palm branches, and lay them on the streets and the pathways that Jesus was walking. In the first century, what actually was happening, it was common practice to do this. This wasn't just unique to Jesus. This was common practice to welcome home a war hero, or to welcome home um, a king. They would lay branches all on the road for him to ride in on. Basically, it's like rolling out the red carpet and saying, here he is. So picture this. Jesus is coming down the Mount of Olives, riding on a donkey, walking on palm branches, and this guy's a big deal. And everybody knows it because Mark is saying those who went ahead and those who followed were shouting, Hosanna! Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! They're just shouting this. See, the word Hosanna means save now. So they're saying, save us now. Hosanna, save now, right? And the Jewish people are hailing him as their savior. And this is his royal procession. Verse 10, it says, blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, they said. Hosanna in the highest. Or save us from the highest place and in the best ways. In other words, they were they were saying, this is it. This is our guy. This is our moment. We got our Messiah. It's, it's like when King David was ruling. In fact, he's from the lineage of David. This is it. This is what Zechariah prophesied. And they're all getting pumped because, boy, boy oh boy, we are not going to be an occupied state anymore. We're going to be able to kick out Rome and who was controlling them and tormenting them. And they're saying, this is the moment. He was going to hosanna them or to save them now. And they were right. Because Jesus is a king that saves. But Jesus is not an ordinary king. And Jesus does not save in ordinary ways. Jesus goes above and beyond the ordinary in your life and mine. He was a king that saved, but in different ways than they anticipated he would save. Have you ever found yourself in a situation... Um, where you thought you knew the way out or you thought you knew the best plans. 
You ever bought a piece of Ikea furniture? Yeah, 100%, right? Like, you bring that thing home. First off, it's 9 million pounds. It takes a pallet jack to move it. And you get it, and you open it up, and you spill all the parts out. And you're like, that's not bad. And then you start putting it together. You throw away the paper, right, that, that's got, like, the little stick figures doing things. And, and you throw that out, obviously, because you don't need that. And you start putting it together, and you end up with, like, five extra pieces and 64 pieces of hardware. And the thing is, like, rickety and falling over. You're like, well, that didn't go according to plan. <laughs> this is the way that some things work in our life. For me in particular, parent, parenting has been like that. So before we ever had kids, I had an opinion on what it was going to be like to raise kids. This is one of my primal opinions. I was like, listen, our kids will never have a tantrum in the grocery store. I looked at Tiffany, and I'm like, first off, they will wait till they get home to open that bag of goldfish. Like, I'm not going to be you know, shoving a lollipop in their mouth any time that they have a problem. Like, this is, what, this is the way I'm going to parent, right? And my firstborn broke me. Like, I was broken. Like, <laughs> I, I changed everything, everything I thought I knew. <laughs> I was like, nope, I take that back. Like, we're going to have to figure that one out. And it's not because it was, there's something wrong with him. It was wrong with me, my expectations of what it was going to be like to be a parent and then how to be a parent to my son, how to parent my daughters. It was going to change. Like everything had to change. It happened different than I expected. And this is how the Jews approach Jesus. They're like, you're bringing a sword, right, Jesus? And he's like, no, I'm bringing in a donkey. <laughs> Let's get that army going and rebuild the walls. Kick them out. Eh. I don't think so. See, we think we know how Jesus should save us, right? Like, Jesus, you should take out my boss. <laughs> like, he's a bum, right? Like, he's a liar and a cheat, and he doesn't like me, so he should be fired. Jesus, you should give me that raise because, man, I deserve it, and it would feel really good. Or, Jesus, you should heal my pain because I am sick and tired of walking with a limp. Or, Jesus, you should solve my kids' problems. I hate seeing them in pain. See, Jesus is a king who saves, but it's not always in the way that we think. And do you know what? That when all of these people were running to Jesus and they're shouting Hosanna, Jesus responded in a really strange way. Luke tells us in chapter 19, verse 41 through 42, that as Jesus approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, he wept over it. Like, here's all these people that are shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna, save us. You're the guy, right? You're the man, King Jesus. And you're shouting Hosanna, and you walk up to Jesus, and he's got tears in his face. And he said, if you, even you, had only known on this day what would bring you peace, but now it's hidden from your eyes. You think you know. You think you know what you need. Ah, but I got it. I got to tell you, you're missing it. You are missing it. See, the word for weeping here is not just like gentle tears running down your face. It means uncontrollable sobs of sorrow. As Jesus is coming down the Mount of Olives, looking at the city of Jerusalem, he is weeping. And why is he weeping? Because five days from now, every person that was saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, is going to be saying, crucify him, crucify him. And Jesus is like, I know that I'm going to let you down. Political power and military might is not the way that I'm going to save he knew that he would be rejected. He knew that they would reject the message of love and self-sacrifice. He knew that they would reject his call to love your enemies and to pray for those who persecute you. See, Jesus was not a conquering king, but he is a prince of peace. The people wanted the way of the sword, like we're going to start swinging swords and taking ears off and killing people. And yet, Jesus went in a different direction. See, they thought, well, let's lead to a revolt to reclaim Jerusalem. But Jesus knew Jerusalem's future, too. So he's weeping because he sees that 35 years later from now, Rome would invade with 60,000 soldiers, and they would storm the city, slaughtering one million Jews and tear down the temple. 
their holiest of holy sites. And that's exactly what happened in 70 AD. 70 AD, the temple was destroyed. But do you understand why Jesus was weeping? He foresaw two temples being destroyed. In 35 years, the Jewish temple would be torn down. But in five days, his temple, his body, would be torn to pieces too. So Jesus weeps for two reasons. Jerusalem's destruction and his own crucifixion. Palm Sunday was a time of sorrow for Jesus. Heart-wrenching sadness as it launched a series of events that led a king to die on a cross to pay for the penalty of our sins. And there's no greater king who, would, who could lay down his life for his people. There's no greater hope that you and I have. There's no greater need than we have than having peace between God and ourselves. Peace from a lifetime of sin. And five days from now, Jesus would be betrayed, arrested, harassed, abused, and tortured. And Mark 15 says that the soldiers led Jesus away into the palace, that's the praetorium, and called together the whole company of soldiers. They put a purple robe on him, and they twisted together a crown of thorns, and they set it on him. And they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews! Again and again they struck him on the head with a staff and they spit on him, falling on their knees. They paid homage to him. And when they had mocked him, they took off his purple robe and put his own clothes on him. And then they led him out to crucify him. This is the only crown that King Jesus would ever wear on earth. And it was a cruel coronation. And there on the cross, while still wearing the crown of thorns, King Jesus, he hung and slowly died for you and for me, taking on the full weight of my sin, of your sin, because this is personal. Don't miss it. When we say that Jesus loves you, what we're saying is that his sacrificial love, the most selfless thing that he could do was to die on the cross for you. This is the only way I can explain this is that it's as if a parent said, I'm gonna die in place of my child. Or I would take a bullet for my wife. I would step in front of whatever it is to, to die in their place. The only difference is that Jesus took on the full weight of our sin. He received the full wrath of God in my place and in your place because this is personal. So what kind of king is Jesus? Well, Jesus is a king who forgave his enemies, who rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, was crowned with thorns, was crushed in a garden, and was enthroned on a cross. All of that so that you and I could be forgiven by God and to know the mercy of our Father in heaven. And I'm telling you, there is no greater king and there is no greater hope because we have a king who rode in on a donkey to die on a cross. On this night that Jesus arrived, he redefined the Passover story because in Mark chapter 14, it says, while they were eating, Jesus took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take it, this is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. See, Jesus took the ordinary Passover elements, the bread and the wine, and he gave them new meaning. They represent my body and my blood shed for you, he said. And Jesus, in essence, had become the Passover lamb whose blood was shed to cover us, to cover our sins. So when we receive communion or the Lord's Supper, we join King Jesus in remembering his death. Some traditions call it the Eucharist, which means thanksgiving for all that Jesus did for you. So understand what you're about to do is the very act of sharing this meal is receiving the bread and the juice, which represents his body and his blood. It's a way of saying, Jesus, I need you. I choose you. I receive your sacrifice in my place. Save me. Hosanna. Forgive me. Free me from my sin so I can follow you as my Lord and Savior. See, this is, this is what it means to follow Jesus, to be a Christian. You accept the sacrifice of Jesus and you put your full faith in him. Today, I want to invite you 
to join me in receiving communion. In the seats in front of you, there's a, a communion cup that's, that's sealed there for you. I'd love for you to grab that. And for all of us in the room, for those of you who follow Jesus, I'd love for you to participate in this with us. Here at Hope City, we practice uh, believers' communion, uh, open communion for you. And, and so on the top, I'd just love for you to peel back this, this little layer of, of plastic and, and to take out the wafer. And see, on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he was with his disciples and he broke that bread. And I want to invite you to break that wafer into two, which represents Jesus' body being broken for you. And together, we're going to eat this in remembrance of Christ and what he did for us. You can do that now. Scripture tells us that after he broke the bread, he took the cup and he passed that around. And so I want to invite you to, to tear that open one more time. And in just a second, you're going to you're gonna to drink this grape juice and as you drink this, let that flavor hit your tongue and your tongue is gonna translate the sweetness of this juice that is in this, this cup here. And would you let it remind you of, of God's love for you, how sweet and how, how amazing and incredible his love is for you. That on the cross, his body was broken and his blood was shed so that you and I could be forgiven for sin. So let's receive this today. 